So talk about talk about burgers this weekend, right? Bro. My guy. <laughs> Might have had the second best burger of my life on the way home from SoCal Open this weekend. It was literally amazing. I don't know what they put in there, but um, I would go back there in a heartbeat. Uh, it was 110%. In fact, Giacomo was like, he came into my house today and he's like, hey, I know I know you work down in San Diego. You know, like maybe I could t- take a day off of work, you know, and really and, and go down and just see how, how things work, you know, like doing your job. And I was like, really? He's just trying to like jump in and and uh, and so he can go back to the burger place because he knows I'm going back. It he was so I'm, goddamn he, good. He knows I'm going back without Gosh, his ass, you know, <laughs> <laughs> where'd you guys get your burgers? You gonna say, G? Uh, I can't remember. Prime, Prime, Prime Burgers is what Prime it's called. Burgers. Prime Burgers. And Prime it's Burgers. In, it's in. Uh, they had seven items on their menu, and you know that's when a place is good. You know. Oh yeah. Like oh, it's yeah. like In and Out. You know, it, they they had their burgers kind of remind you of In and Out, but like top tier. And they had these tallow fries, and they had like their own custom hot sauce. They had American cheese fries. Um, Dude, it was it was lit. It was yeah. You know, if there's only like seven things that are really good at making those specific seven things, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, dude, I'm down for a shake right now. But they didn't sell any shakes, you know. And I was like, all right, yeah, it is what it is. Their you know? sweet tea was good though. Yeah, sweet tea was pretty good. It was pretty it was good. Very good. And um, I learned about American cheese. I didn't know about American cheese. Like I knew of it, but I didn't know the properties of it. You know. Yeah. Um, I was always scared of like American cheese. And I watched this one Nile red video about how American cheese is act, what it, what it is actually. Right. And essentially, uh, American cheese is just cheese that they melt. They put a small chemical in it that helps it retain water. So it's just like cheese water, but solidified. And so it's like, it's, it's essentially, I, I put it like this, you know, cereal, you know, when your, mm-hmm. your cereal gets a little soggy, it's like sure. soggy cereal. Oh, <laughs> so just soggy American cheese. cheese is soggy cheese. Yep. And, okay. and I was like afraid of it. You know, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. My wife says, you know, bad. And then I watched that video. And I was like, oh, it's just cheese with a little water. I'm down. I, now I just eat that yeah. stuff all like G came over this I, morning three of them. and I was like, I just, I had like three of those. Yeah. Just peel them off the plastic. <laughs> and just like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yes, Jesus back in my life. I am not lactose intolerant. I am uh, colorblind. That's besides the point. <laughs> would you, would you give up your colorblindness, but you can't eat cheese anymore? Hell no. I don't know what colors are and I'm down to keep it that way. All right, I like that. I like that. That's the squad game <laughs> podcast promise. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Did you know our podcast name was almost um, three color minimum? Mm-hmm. Three color minimum. Three color minimum. Yeah, it was almost three. I color think minimum. I, I think I like the current one better. I appreciate that. It'd appreciate. Be, that. Yeah, it's the better choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, and so we have you on today because uh, this is the next edition. Uh, we just ran our very first third edition tournament. Saw a lot of high level play, a lot of brand new players. Uh, we recorded it all, and uh, you won Jeshua with Legionaries. Yeah. In fact, it went Legionaries, Nemesis Claw, Legionaries, Legionaries. <laughs> the top four <laughs> spots. Maybe, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I think there was thirty six total players uh, for this event, and uh, yeah, it was a it was a nail biter at the end. You know, it was exciting. Yeah. yeah. I'll see if I can pull up the best the best ghost pairings. Yeah, I believe that there were five legionary players and four of the five were top ten. Yeah, and then the only other legionary player won day two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like he literally got first place in the secondary pod. So how SoCal yeah, yeah how SoCal Open works for everyone, everyone knows. Um, how we retain pretty much everyone is we run uh, a champs event on Saturday. There's a top eight cut. And after the top eight cut, we have uh, a day two event. So top eight come, uh, everyone else is just cut. The tournament is over. The top eight play three rounds and everyone else comes back for a whole nother tournament on, on Sunday that indicates like, uh, and then you basically score two ITC scores and two hobby track scores within a weekend. If you don't make top eight, 
it's fantastic. It's a, it's a great reason to go. Um, yeah, so let's pull up. I remember um, Melty came up to me after he won day two and was like, I felt kind of bad that I was playing Legionary into everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, foreboding the strength that they would have mm -hmm. on this episode. Uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> I think there's a couple things that people have said uh, the biggest drawbacks so far of this edition uh, from what people are saying. Um, Hey there, sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let everyone know that we are 50% sold out for LVO this year, which is going to be the largest Kill Team event on planet Earth. So if you guys are looking to grab your tickets, uh, there's an affiliate link down below. If you don't want to use an affiliate link, just go to flgfrontlinegaming.com uh, and get your tickets there. It's going to be a wonderful event, and we really uh, are excited to host the largest event for Kill Team once again. So far, people despise the third vantage point uh, because you put a 40 millimeter sniper, a Space Marine sniper on the top and no one can charge him because uh, no base can fit up there. Uh, and then the other thing people are, are, are really despising about this, uh, this, this thing is that they, they don't like hafting to table their opponents and having to be so ruthless. I think that people have to get the old edition out of their minds and kind of um, readjust uh, to throat stomping your opponents uh, because the kill, kill is introduced back into the game. And um, for instance, Jason Steinke, who, who won last year, had multiple opportunities to like get a five-man blast off on turning point one and just didn't do it because he he didn't want to create a bad experience and that's the sportsmanship right mm -hmm. um because a lot of these players it's it wasn't their first time playing it was their first time playing the new edition or their third or fifth or sixth game you know i know that jesh how many games do you think you had before you actually came you actually rolled I'm, here? uh i may have had upwards of like 30. yeah right and like that prep, that, that, that prep really helps. And you're already great at the game. So, um, just kind of like going through everything and, and, um, beating, beating people into the ground is something that people have to just kind of get used to. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, you know, like you have to, you have to kill things to win the game. And if you don't yeah. kill things, you don't win, you know? Uh, and there's also yeah. something very different between the play at top level and mid-level and and low-level games uh, a lot of the times at low-level games no one would ever move and it was like a very very slow slow game uh, mid-level games everyone ran into the middle and everyone was dead or one player was just completely board wiped top level was just like the low-level games where they weren't moving very far it seemed like it was moving rather slow but they were not committing a lot of forces until turning point three and turning point four. Of course, there was a couple of players that were more aggressive, right? Uh, Janice, who won the golden ticket, was generally more aggressive than I think the rest of the top eight. Um, but that is something that I noticed was that people weren't re willing to trade early, um, which was interesting. Uh, before we, we move to, to Jesh, oh, let me... So uh, for this event, we had Jesh with Legionaries, Austin with Nemesis Claw. We had a bracket event, so it tried to do a Swiss bracket, but it was just a pure bracket system. So I had to change uh, a couple a couple people around. James Robinson um, got third. Janice got fourth. Kellen with Hyrotech got fifth. Charlotte with Void Dancers got seventh. Sam with uh, Lucy and Star Shaders got seventh, and then Edgar Quintero from uh, from Seattle got eighth with Nemesis Claw. It's fascinating that five of the top eight players were elite chaos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might show how powerful some of these teams are in this current edition. It's kind of stupid. Yeah, tell us more. So. Specifically on the topic of like legionary, mm -hmm. they gave them way too much defensive buff on top of their offensive buff. So I found a lot of people tried doing stuff like corn or zine or Slanesh to try and increase the offensive buff 
of their team that already has a lot of offense. And it's still a very, very good team without Nurgle. But having Nurgle to literally make yourself like 18 models with no piercing and then having the offense that they have is really dumb. That is fair. Yeah, and I know you didn't fight into any... Um, any. I think we only had one Inquisition player. Uh, yeah. But if, but if you did and they blocked or Nurgle, you just go Slanesh and then you go really fast at them and you, you murder them in close combat. So, yeah, because you can also take the Warriors who can change to whatever mark they want when they activate, which is also dumb because it makes <laughs> it so that... <laughs> so, like, I could theoretically run one leader and five warriors with bolt guns and malefic blades into inquisition and just change based off what they deny it's fantastic it's amazing yeah it's weird it's i don't know why they gave them that most other warriors got like a lethal five or a free ploy but no joshua um let's remember um games workshop decided to publish this team and blades of lame uh, with Shrek and Scorpions having a four up save. Um, so I don't know. Hashtag what they're thinking. Safe. Yeah. You know, have to, <laughs> they absolutely have to. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so we're going to get into a deep dive on Legionary and how you found yeah. success with them. So everyone else can find success with them, uh, including worlds. You know, you're going to teach Spain how to play uh Legionary here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Then we're going to find out they like learning Soul Nash and they're going to kick our asses somehow. <laughs> gonna... It is Spain after all, you know? Uh, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Um, yeah, so another thing that I found interesting before we get like fully into it, uh, Nemesis Claw was also super, super strong um, yeah. in this edition. And so are, I believe Angels of Death are really, really strong. In fact, I yeah. really want to, I have a theory for Angels of Death that I really want to test. Angels of oh, Death I heard of this theory. suck into Legionary. Like, like we were doing our two early tier list and we we're like, no, they, I was like, they could have play, you know, who knows? And like, <laughs> my gosh, they, every single Angels of Death player running into a chaos, it, like any kind of chaos would just get rolled. The Emperor was not on their side. <laughs> Um, it was crazy. And I think the only time that you saw them maybe win is when the sniper kind of like popped off. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, that didn't happen. Clearly all of the chaos made top eight, except for one yeah. again, who, who won day two. Um, yeah. but my theory for angels of death is to run six assault intercessors all with, uh, duelist, uh, both of the, the close combat things and then tilting shields. Um, just to see if that would work, you know? But one of these days, Jess, you're going to have to come up here and play on one of our battle reports. And Oh, uh, yeah. We're uh, going to have to test that theory. Yeah, and uh, you can roll me then and prove <laughs> my theory is bad. So. I think there's not much else you can do because since Legionary can turn off piercing, your shooting is essentially regular bolters against I can manipulate a two-up save. So yeah. it does like nothing. The warded armor is nuts. Like you just get it every time. Yeah, it um, used to be you pick one model and once per shot, they pretty much a once per game thing. They had a two up save until they took damage, which sucked. You never took it. It took it cost three equipment points, but now it's like you get four two up saves per game. Yeah. It's do crazy. you think? Do you think if it was once per battle, but you always have someone who could just have it when you need it on anybody instead of just uh, dedicating it to one person would work? I believe it'd be a lot more balanced if you had to pick one person for the entire game before the game. Oh, before the game. See, I was thinking it could just happen like, oh, I need warded armor now, suddenly. Like, I'm going to use it. Um, like, a, I feel like that makes it two. I feel like no one would take it if it was just like a once per... Like, if it was like the phase shifter for higher tech, where it's like a once per action per game, I feel like no one would ever take it. Not really worth it. But okay. I don't really know how you balance warded armor. You might either you make it one... Okay. You make it once per turn, once per game. So one turn out of the game, you give someone a two of save. You probably balance it like that. Okay. If you I think like, so. I like your I like your previous idea of giving the previous the, idea of picking one, someone before the game. One model, uh, the warder. And arm. they always have a two up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could live. With I that. think that'd probably be good too, because I'd being able to change it. it based on the situation is really good. Yeah, the the team is just too adaptable. But you know, yeah. 
people are going to learn out how to play them until Games Workshop uh, nerfs them uh, because the Emperor found out how strong they were and it was like, hey, you know, yeah. you're not allowed. Well, here's not the thing. Allowed. <laughs> with the past Chaos editions, with the past Chaos teams like Falgor or Commandos, which are Xenos, it doesn't matter, they took like eight consecutive nerfs to finally get fixed. You're not wrong. I mean, Commandos are still are ridiculous there's a lot of commanders teams. are so good there are teams that we did not see at socal open that are very very strong uh, yeah. i think i think everyone's just really excited about elites and we'll have to see if there's any other teams outside of a really well inquisition team i still think like inquisition's a very good team i think it's just going to be very difficult to um to run them efficiently um but yeah you know, they're it's, it's you know, very expensive to get them and they're going to be really hard to run yeah all right, so let's move into Legionary here. I like the yep. new symbol. You know, the new symbol is really cool. I love it. Demon Blade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Jeshua, what drew you to uh, Legionary? So, what drew me to Legionary was I had already played them for a few months last year during second edition, and I had some success. I had some failures. They did still struggle into any team that had reliable access to piercing, like plasmas, melters, anything, because piercing two just bullied twelve wound models that had no invul. When I saw the rules for the balefire and some of the rules for the marks of chaos, like the corn and slash rules, and I saw on the pace they were going, I realized that fourteen wound legionary models with the adaptability they had with the marks, especially with the fact that it showed they would not have restrictions to what mark they could take, I realized it was going to be really good. And then when the rules officially released for the entire team and I read them, I realized it was stupid. So that's kind of what drew me into it. The fact that I had already known the team and that I liked their play style and that I knew they were going to be good. I had no idea they were going to be this good. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that is that is fair. I know that you guys had inklings about this team uh, as you guys have yeah. been playing them uh, since the fifth. Um, and I I'm interested in what was the kind of like your hardest practice matchups leading up to uh like was there a specific team that you guys were practicing in the kel team cave with a c with a c uh, <laughs> yeah uh yes. that that ga that was giving you trouble that kind of helped you prep for the for socal open yeah so there were there was one main team and another team that i had, I had some troubles with the main team that has some play into Legionary was that I found was Hyrotech. So what Hyrotech can do is if they take the Technomancer, they they play KG turn one. Don't let me punish them and give them multiple charges off or multiple strikes. They need to play around the fact that they need to only allow me to get one or two kills per turn. And what they can do is give lethal five in rending to a death mark and then do six to eight mortal wounds on a legionary per shot with crits and I don't retain crit saves anymore. So even though I ignore the piercing, it's just hard to save in general. So the death marks have really good damage output and the technomancer can heal along with the fact that I can't kill off against them because they just revive and undo it. It makes them hard to play against. Mm -hmm. And I believe we got like eight or so games in of that matchup. And I only won like 25% of the time. That's great. It was, yeah, it was a it's a difficult matchup that I did not run to run into at SoCal. And I found the only way to have play into it is if you're on in the dark in such a way where they can't play KG, well, there you go. That's fine. Or if you just go one hundred percent aggression, turn two, and give them six shots a turn, they can't reliably remove more than two a turn. And then you'll be killing them at a fast enough rate where you can pull it off. It's interesting. Uh, Kellen seemed like he was going to be unstoppable at this event. He, any, yeah. anyone he ran into, Kellen is one of your teammates. Um, yeah. He he was playing higher tech, and uh, he ran over all the legionary players that he ran into at SoCal Open, including Janus on day yeah. one. And then he he played against James Robinson on Into the Dark, and James found a way. Yeah, uh, he Let's definitely did. He, he found the way. Yeah, yeah. Chaos <laughs> finds a way. Uh, <laughs> if anyone's looking to check out these games, we will be posting them on YouTube in the future. But currently, we will be having them on our Patreon and YouTube membership. Uh, we're currently editing them uh, for YouTube guidelines because, you know, uh, we 
had some casters sometimes say a couple curse words. We got to cut those out. Everyone gets very excited when they're playing and watching the game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have a tad bit of editing to do. And uh, once that editing is done, those will be up on Patreon and YouTube membership if you guys want to see those early. Otherwise, uh, we'll probably release the tournament sometime near Worlds um, because we'll be going to Worlds and we won't be making content for that week or week and a half. Uh, so that should be exciting, uh, to say the least. But going back to Legionary here. Um, that's interesting that you you also have a very pretty uh, pretty painted um, Legionary team. I really like the Slanesh Corn theme that you guys really went with with your Legionaries. Yeah. Very now, I can't take credit for that. We had another an old teammate of ours paint those. So, But yeah, they are really nice looking Legionary. They definitely are. So... Uh, it, do you have a favorite legionary model like uh look wise or anything like that or is there one specific that you like more than others maybe competitively instead of over looks or aesthetics yeah if we're looking over aesthetics i really like the chosen with the demon blade mm -hmm. very appealing model love that model mm -hmm. if we're talking competitively the balefire is so clutch like the healing if you're able to keep the balefire safe and punch with two or three models and then run in and heal like two models or one up to full wounds it's so good the, like the, the healing with him is really good specifically because he heals a decent amount while also killing the enemy so it's like a two for one trade that's crazy yeah, yeah I, it was nuts i kept seeing you guys do that exact thing every nemesis cop player was doing that it was uh sorry every legionary player was doing that and it was nuts yeah that's wild that is wild. it's disgusting how like yeah you hurt me that doesn't really matter i'm gonna heal yeah. it all back it was nothing <laughs> yeah there were multiple times i brought like a one wound legionary up to like 10 wounds or so yeah I was like uh the melt together oh. oh my gosh yeah yeah Giacomo saw one of those <laughs> yeah I brought a one wound melt up to eight wounds. So we're going to move on to. Let's, let's see, see here. here. Hold on. Hold on. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry about, about that, that, fellas. Um, um, all, right. all right. Sorry. sorry I, I just realized, realized my, my, I got to mark, mark this time, time down. down. 22, 22, 22. Uh, 20. I uh, realized that my audio hasn't been recording this entire time. So, G, I'm going to need the audio files. I will give you the audio files. Okay. So, I'll mark that. Just give them to me raw so we can match them up. Okay. Okay. Moving on. Sorry, fellas. No worries. So, Jesh. Yep. Um, this is the team my guy we have did you choose the chosen or the aspiring champion more often or was it match dependent um it's it's definitely match dependent but i took the champion more okay so the extra apl especially on into the dark or certain missions where you're needing to do multiple mission actions the champions extra apl is really good because you can reliably do two, like two to three fights and shoots while also tapping a point so like loot and transmission, that's really helpful. Or op opening doors in the dark, that's really helpful. So even though the Chosen heals a ton, I like the champion a lot. That's fair. That's fair. Did you find yourself um, running the Melta or the uh, Plasma more often? Um, do you like Plasma in this edition? So the Plasma, although not nearly as good, is still a good model. I typically like taking the plasma into teams that have 10 or less wounds and no invuln save because AP1 with five base damage when going hot is reliably going to just still remove one model that has 10 or less wounds, especially if you have like lethal five. Mm -hmm. So it's still a good model, but the Melta is way better. So if you're facing like any elite team or any team with invulns, if you're going to take a gunner, you're taking the Melta. That's fair. It does make the most sense. It does. Yeah. It does make the most sense. I mean, you can still there's flamethrower has some play, but really, I don't think you're using it as much, right? I don't know if I I've, I don't think I'd ever take the flamethrower. Okay. Only you, if Tyranids play. ever get released, Giacomo, and they have twenty models. <laughs> I know Games <laughs> yeah. Workshop has already said like the maximum is fourteen, but still, that's you know, 20, 20 model Tyranid team. That's what I'm rooting for. 
Yeah. yeah. And the teams that I would take the Chosen into is pretty much just... Uh, I find myself taking it into higher tech because they rely on bringing you lo low on wounds and then finishing you off with certain models. So if you're able to charge and kill and then go back to full wounds, it's it make, it's a nice tool to have against them. Mm. So for archetypes, uh, did you find yourself taking security or seeking destroy more? Primarily security. Okay. So and elites, specifically legionary, really like contain against most teams. Even if the opponent out activates you, you have such a thick wall of Nurgle, because Nurgle is generally what I found myself taking, that they're not going to really get past you. And I found myself typically scoring five to six points on the tag up. And whenever I wasn't taking contain on certain Volcus boards, where there's two strongholds in the center of the board, you can score take ground very easily. So I took take ground sometimes as well. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, yeah I find I find myself taking. Um security with uh vet veteran guard as well over yeah. seek and destroy i think seek and destroy is uh they definitely nerfed quite heavily this edition. yeah although into teams that have 12 or more wounds like that's gonna primarily fall into elites champion is still a pretty good choice because if you just pick a model who's gonna counter punch like the melta then you'll reliably score two points on champion every turn that's fair it's interesting um I did see champion taken quite a lot. Uh, I, I know your opponent, Austin Lewis, took a champion quite a few times uh, whenever yeah. he was fighting other elites. Um, but I, that's also, you know, his particular play style. He's a much more aggressive player than right. I think the majority of the player base um, yeah. in uh, in kill team right now, right? Like, and maybe I'd maybe agree. that's maybe that's good sometimes, but you know, sometimes it can it can backfire. Um, yeah. Didn't at this tournament. You crushed it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, did what legionary operatives were you taking on, like usual, or yeah. do you have specific loadouts for against specific teams? So I haven't played against enough of the teams to have like set loadouts against them, but there's pretty much three auto takes that I always have. I always take an icon bear. Mm -hmm. The the weapon can change. But, but um, I always take an Icon Bearer, I always take the Balefire Acolyte, and I pretty much always take the Anointed. Those are three models that I, I, I don't think I've ever really considered dropping any of them other than the Anointed. But I realized, like, so for, against Hyper Tech, if they're not letting me charge them, and I'm taking wounds when I charge them, I consider the Anointed to not really be optimal. But the fact of the matter is, he's so tough that he needs to eat multiple of their shots. So the Anointed's toughness and melee output is so good, you'd, like, never drop it. And he can still shoot when demon mode now, which I don't know if people realize that. It doesn't say anywhere on his data card that you cannot shoot with him. So anointed icon bearer for the extra CP and Balefire for the healing are just like three models you always take. That's fair. Yeah. And then for the other models, the I typically find myself taking the champion and then the chosen into the teams where they're relying on you being chipped. But the, for the other ones, it's pretty much going to be the butcher, tribe talon or a gunner or the heavy gunner that's pretty much those four mm. i could i could see going back to your uh contain i could see elven teams being able to to deny contain just because of how fast they are or yeah. or, or or void dancers or something in, yeah into, into void dancers what would you take um i actually did take contain against void dancers and i scored all six points for it mm. primarily because it was on in the dark so that made it easier for sure on open, I don't know if I would take contain against them because they are so fast. Right. Um, I against void dancers, I would probably take take ground if it was open, if the board was right, or I would take. Hmm. I might do storm objectives. I haven't played against void dancers on open. They might be hard to score tack ups against. But I think I probably would. I'm, if that's the case, if the board is wrong, I might literally still just do contain because I kill their models too fast for them to be able to run a model off the board to deny my points. They need to focus on their points too. Mm. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. So we're going to move into some of the um, other tactics with the team. Uh, there are yeah. quite a few fun things that they can do currently. We'll see if uh, Games Workshop nerfs those things into the ground, you know, but for now they are quite good. Um, 
we were talking before the podcast started and you said that you could take like five warriors plus your leader uh, and the team would probably still be S tier. Yeah. So since the warriors are so versatile and can change their mark based off what you're playing into in a turn, it's still super good against most teams. You could beat most horde teams or Eldari or teams that aren't like high A to S tier just by taking the warriors because you can give them either chain swords or bolt guns. And if you give them bolt, bolt guns, you can give them malefic blades and then switch to corn and have chain swords plus bolt guns, which is really dumb. <laughs> That's fair. So, yeah, they're just so versatile. They're, it's such a good team, even with the warriors, because they're 14 wounds with great toughness and damage output still. Mm. So, um, you said that you pretty much took Nurgle all the time. Um, yeah, I think there was only one round where I took two Zinch. That's exciting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to explain what the marks are and how to use them within the team? Yeah. So, corn is corn is a mark that gives you severe in melee, and the strat ploy for it is team wide. Regardless of your mark, you get plus one on the first strike in combat. And if you're corn, you add one base damage to the stat of all corn operatives. And like mathematically, it's insanely good because you can take a power fist champion and a butcher, both corn, add their damage and make them six eight and they're one and they're two tapping elites. They're like the only thing in the game that can two tap elites. But I think Nurgle's still better, and I'll get into that. The other one, there's other ones, Zinch gives you punishing. No, not punishing. Severe and shooting. So you can auto-flip a hit to a crit and shooting. And then their ploy is team-wide. You get punishing regardless of your mark. And Zinch operatives basically get punishing in defense saves. So if you roll a crit save, you turn a miss save to a regular save. Now, isn't it also that this uh, that you can also take tainted rounds with Zinch and it kind of becomes yes. like a, a super Ugh. crazy... Uh, you want to go over that combo? Yeah, so I do really like the idea of like a Zinch icon bearer with a bolt gun because what you can do is you can just you can sit on a back point with a bolt gun then shoot with zinch auto getting a crit and give it the tainted rounds equipment which gives you rending once per turn and you can shoot pretty much auto guaranteeing two crits and two hits because you'll have punishing twice so it's really good yeah so you i will clarify that the tainted hits. rounds equipment can only be used once per activation so you can't double shoot with rending. You can only have one of the shots be rending, but it's still really good. Thank ah. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank goodness. So did we go over Slanesh? No. So Slanesh base adds one of the moves out of all Slanesh operatives. And then the strat ploy is in melee. All operatives worsen the hit stat of one to enemy operatives when they're fighting or retaliating. So it's basically an, a melee injury, but it's cumulative with injury. So you could take a model, it's three ups, and if they're injured, now they're five ups. Which oh, is really, oh, really oh. dumb. Yeah. It's crazy. It yeah. is and then, crazy. Yeah. The, the Solnash benefit for it is Solnash operatives, if they've moved during that turn, enemy operatives that shoot at them worsen their hit stat by one, which is also cumulative with injury. So basically, Solnash treat other enemy operators as injured in melee and shooting whereas team wide is just melee yeah imagine like injuring uh, a pathfinder that hits on fours yeah that's then, what i was saying and then like and then like moving and being like can you hit me now can you see me yeah. now? you know dude we got to make like a whole john cena team and just make them all slanesh <laughs> operatives you know they all speak yeah. chinese and they all they're all doing this you know Be yeah <laughs> yeah then finally and my like there's there's also undivided there's no strap for undivided but the benefit for undivided is if you're within six inches and you're shooting fighting or retaliating your friendly operatives get ceaseless mm -hmm. which is good but i don't know there's only a couple situations where i can ever think you take it and i haven't tried it yet so i don't know but on to the cream of the crop there's nurgle the main benefit of nurgle is nurgle operatives every time they take a normal damage of three or more you roll dice and the five up it's minus one which is an okay ability. It's essentially like a, the transfer for a 6-up Fiona Pain. Mm -hmm. It's good. It hardly ever comes into play in my games. It kicks in occasionally, and it's nice when it does, but I don't rely on it. The main thing is their strat ploy is team-wide. All operatives ignore injury, so they can't be injured. And then the Nurgle benefit 
is when you're shot at by piercing, you reduce the piercing by one. And that is so good. It's it's like insane because that means that most teams which only have one access to piercing two or no access to piercing two shoot against your three and two up saves with potentially buff saves with no piercing. And it makes it makes you so tough they can't fight you or shoot you. Because you're yeah. Yeah, and it's even worse. It's way worse uh, when you're in Volcus or in on Into the Dark because there's so much heavy. There's like yeah. so much obscuring, and it's like, okay, I finally got a shot off on this guy. Uh, I can't retain any crits, and uh, P1's down, and I'm going to lose a dice, you know? And it's like, okay, well, why shoot? <laughs> why? Yeah, it's... <laughs> Yeah, the teams that essentially now, what you have to do against Legion now is have a way to retain multiple crits, which is why I was saying Heretic is a tough matchup, because they can give Lethal 5 and run into their death marks. I haven't played against Hearts and Salvagers yet, but that might also be tough. I feel like reducing their piercing is tough for them, and the fact that I have to be killing them for them to be retaining crits also would be hard. So I don't know how that matchup goes. I feel like Legion has to have an advantage for that. But there are three teams I've thought of so far where I feel like you take Slanesh over Nurgle. Mm -hmm. Which teams are those? Would you do that to? So, I I think they're Pathfinders, Blades of Lame, and Mandrakes. Mm, all Elven teams. Like Slanesh was made to defeat Elves. Wow. You know? Well, how perfect is that? Yeah, <laughs> and it's because since they don't really have wide access to piercing or any access to piercing, the injury to their shooting is way better. That's fair. Like like against Mandrakes and uh, Blades of Lame, who have, I'm pretty sure it's zero piercing. If you're injuring them and shooting, that's all you need because your piercing has no effect if they have no piercing. You know, know something else about Blades of Lame? I'm pretty sure what? that the Dire Avengers have, have accurate, which like negates the reason why you want to, like you have rending, so you want to like get crits for them. So it's just like. Why would you ever? It's a okay. bad. Yeah. It's yeah, well, bad. yeah, that's, that's definitely good. <laughs> I have to double check that, but uh, what about yeah. un what is undivided? So, undivided is the ceaseless within six inches for any fight, shoot, or retaliation. And I realized that there are two teams that that might potentially be good into to take undivided, mm -hmm. and I think those are Colt and Geller Box. Okay. So my thought process behind that is you almost never really need the secondary benefits from your things, your strapoids, into them. Because you don't really need punishing in your saves. They don't really have shooting. They don't you don't have really P1. need. Yeah, they don't have P one. They don't have. Um, they don't really have wide access shooting short injury or P one. They don't have the necess necessity for the corn plus one damage because you're wanting to shoot them anyway. And then what's the last one? Injury damage and the two shooting ones. So yeah, they're not shooting you. They're not fighting you. And you don't need it. Yeah, so Undivided is good for the Ceaseless, and you only need the original primary benefit for your whole team. So I think those are the only situations where you might, might take Undivided, because they're also injuring you, which would make it necessary for the rerolls. Oh, fascinating. Hmm. I haven't played it yet, but I think that might be good. I think that's fair. I think that it is. I think you're on the right track, to say the least, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's see here. What is next up on this? We have strategy ploys here. Um, did you use a lot of strategy ploys? Uh, I know that uh, it was funny. I know uh, James Robinson, all, he, he took third at this event. Yeah. And um, I know he fought Janice twice. She had his number on game one, day one, and then he got her back on day two. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost like Legionary v. Legionary is, is a slightly difficult matchup, you know? Mm -hmm. It can be very swingy. Um. But he he definitely had a couple um he definitely didn't use any any CP. Uh at one point in time on turning point three, he had eight CP and used all eight on turning point three in one game. <laughs> I can see wild. that. Wild. Wild. So why don't you uh what 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 makes it so that they don't have to spend CP turning point one? And did that ever come up for you? Is that a normal thing? Yeah, I almost never spend CP turn one because first of all, you don't need punishing and shooting. You're playing safe. You're not trying to shoot the opponent unless 
they give you an opportunity to take a really adv advantageous turn one shot. You don't need to be injuring them in melee and shooting because you're trying not to give them shots and you're not going to be fighting someone turn one. And then you don't need to be adding damage to your melee because you're definitely not fighting them turn one. The main one that you might spend turn one is implacable to turn off their piercing and help you stay alive, especially if you're taking Nurgle. Um, but I only found myself paying for that once, and I do it with the free ploy from the equipment the scouting phase option. Not the equipment, the scouting phase option. That's fair. So That's I fair. almost found myself spending zero CP turn one. It's funny, on some of our YouTube comments, we've gotten um, that taking a ploy turning point one is a trap and is bad. And uh, I just <laughs> I just disagree. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's very like, good in certain situations. Like, Legionary are very CP hungry, which is why they need the Icon Mirror. So you mm. make sure you keep the Icon Mirror alive. But I generally start turn two with seven CP. That's a lot. It's a lot of CP. Yeah. Are you fighting to go first or are you fighting to go second to ensure you get the extra CP turning point? Um, I play around both. I play around the fact that I can capitalize if I go first. And I play around the fact that I can use the CP I get if I go second. So I'm not pushing myself too far, but I'm also not holding entirely back. I'm kind of finding a balance to use either one. That's fair. That's fair. Um. For Fireflight ploys, uh, what did you find yourself using most? And can we can you take us through all three of these or four of these and tell us uh, when you would use them for like, yeah. let's say a new player was looking to, to start playing this team? Yeah. So there's the Corn Firefight ploy, which is Unending Bloodshed. And it's use this Firefight ploy when a friendly legionary Corn operative is incapacitated while fighting or retaliating. You can strike the enemy operative in that sequence with one of your unresolved successful successes before it's removed from the kill zone. And I never ran a corn operative, so it never came into play for me, but I think it is pretty pretty good in the situation you do run corn. I just never found myself using it. Then there's Thicken and Captivation, which is the Slash ploy, and it's essentially pick an operative during the Slash operative's activation, and you can stun an, op an enemy operative within three inches. That's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty good, especially against two APL teams. So when you're running a Slash operative, that's really good. Then there's I didn't really run an option, run it often because I didn't take Slanesh. Mm -hmm. So I'm I like I said I pretty much only ran Nurgle. There's two it's, situations in which I ran Zinch. It's crazy because I noticed that all the legionary players had like different were doing different things. Like some people were running like two two and two. Like I don't think a lot of them ran corn. I think only one player ran corn. Um, mm -hmm. And like I mean I could be wrong, but. Uh, sick, sickening captivation I did see used a couple times and it's it's crazy because like uh, you know stun can last until the the your opponent's end of the, your opponent's next activation so yeah so if you take a Slanesh drive talent charge double kill two operatives stun two operatives with his uh like um I forget what it's called but he has an ability to where every time he incapacitates an enemy operative in melee he takes an enemy operative within three inches and stuns them if you pair that with sickening captivation, you can stun three operatives. Ugh. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. That is wild. Yeah. And then there's Malignant Aura, which is the Nurgle one. And what it is, is during a Nurgle operative's activation, you pay a CP, and for the rest of the turn, any enemy operative within three inches of that Nurgle operative is treated as having piercing one for your friendly weapons, unless it already has piercing one. What that means is when you shoot in an area of shoot at an enemy operative within three inches of that Nurgle operative, it gives you piercing one. So, like, your life siphon, your bolt pistols, your bolt guns, anything that does not have piercing one gets piercing one. That's I believe that's crazy. how it works. That's crazy. Ugh. Yeah, it, as long as it doesn't already have piercing one. So it doesn't stack with piercing one, doesn't give up mm -hmm. plasma piercing two, right. but, yeah. And that, yeah. that, to me, seems like the most fair so far of all the ones we've looked at. Yeah. I found myself using that one a couple times, but it's very situational. Very good, but very situational. Mm -hmm. So then there's the final one, which is mutability and change. It's the Zinch ploy, and you just pick an operative when you activate them and give them a fourth APL. Or uh, you add one to its APL stat. Yeah. <laughs> Disgusting. But... And, yeah, and I never found myself using it because I didn't take Zinch, but if you do take Zinch, it is so good to be able to have especially on Into the Dark. It's so good on Into the Dark because you can like give a melt of Zinch and then open a door. You can pay a CP to give him mutability and change. Open a door, move, shoot, 
move dash shoot. Wait, you can open door, move shoot, go on guard with a melta. <laughs> You shoot with the with, and go yeah. with the melter, right? Yeah, it's yeah, kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. Because you, you'll be getting punishing and severe when you do it, too. Ugh. It's so <laughs> gross. <laughs> it's so gross. Uh, That's yeah, exciting. Okay. All right. Uh, Zinch is pretty good still. Zinch is pretty yeah. good, everyone. I can see why people are running them. So, um, what it, so I know you talked about it a little bit, the aspiring champion. What do you typically take on him when you take him, and what teams are you taking him into? And then we can yeah. go over the chosen. So I pretty much take the champion into it's less there are it is match dependent in some cases, but it's also kind of board dependent and mission dependent whether I take the champion or the chosen. But when I do take him, I take him with a power fist against teams that have seven or eight wounds because you can add one damage with the core employ. So he's just he's reliably one tapping them even without corn because with five dice you should be rolling at least a crit every now and then. And if you don't, you're still brutal doing you're two tapping them anyway. So the power fist is really good even though it hits on fours because you have the equipment to help that later. We can get into that. And his in the eyes of the gods ploy or not ploy ability to get an APL whenever he kills an enemy operative makes him very efficient at either triple killing or double killing while scoring your points with missions. Gross. So, theoretically, yeah, he could get five APL if he was Zinch. I don't think so because I think models are still capped out at only one extra than what they have. Okay, one extra. Okay, okay. So a five APL goodness. model though would be really, really dumb because you can give him a tainted bolt pistol and then charge, fight, fight, shoot, shoot. Well, I think for the Astartes things, they can either choose to fight twice or shoot twice, right? They can't do necessarily both. Oh, I don't know. Let's find out. We yeah. Can either. Can perform either two shoots or two fight actions. Okay, two shoots or two fights. And then what it means you could do is you could open a door, charge, fight, fight, shoot, do a mission action. Yeah. Could be better. Could be better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's disgusting. That is disgusting. Uh, what about uh, chose, uh, the Legionary Chosen? Yep, so the Chosen. So... With both leader options, I never really found myself taking the bolt pistol because I like the damage of the positive pistol better. It's reliably killing, whereas the tainted bolt pistol could shoot and whiff. So even the double shooting, I never really found myself needing it. So positive pistol, and then you only have the demon blade, but the demon blade's so good with four, seven, lethal five. So he could potentially roll into an elite and get two crits and hit him for seven both times. Yeah, that's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. And what, he's getting five attacks? Yeah, five on threes. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. And then his abilities are on a three-up, enemy operatives cannot fall back from him, which makes him really good into horde teams, like and, Pathfinders or Deathcore, stuff like that. Really good into um, uh, Blades of Lame. And, Blades of Lame. And uh, Harlequins. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It does. Yeah. The, the, what do you call it? The fallback. Mm -hmm. Curtain falls. Oh, curtain falls. On a 3-up, yeah. it is. Still. Yep. And he can still pay for blood for the blood god and one-tap Eldari. So, uh, yeah. Why are With Marine lethal against... five. <laughs> why is the Marine captain tap, capped at seven only with his ability? <laughs> You know what, Giacomo? <laughs> they get eight we, don't eight. Ask, we don't ask questions. Yeah. We don't. This is irrelevant. Here. Wait, yeah. could you do nine damage with, let's say, a demon blade, right? Because if he's corn, uh, you'd add one damage to all their. Thrones, no. And then you no. Okay. Can't yeah. So how it's you. worded as it's worded as instead of adding one on the first strike, you add one to the damage stat. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Instead of. So yeah, if you could do nine, that wow. would be like really dumb. <laughs> that would be exciting. Dumber than it already is. Yeah. And then w one yeah. tap of Vespid. His Maybe. other ability, which is Soul Gorge, which is the better of the two abilities, is after each combat in which he incapacitated an enemy operative or struck with a crit, he heals D3 plus three wounds. Uh, plus three. Uh, he basically heals himself every time. That's crazy. He basically charges in. He's his own medic. Kills, he, his killing in melee is basically shooting because he takes no punch back. Yeah, this is this is like the this is like as disgusting as the um, the Mandrake's leader is. Oh, with um, the Ubilix. Yeah, the Ubilix. Yeah, except it's better. 
Yeah, you're not wrong. Because it's guaranteed. Yeah, because you're pretty much two tapping an Ubliex guy. You know, if you, yeah, it's crazy. So at worst, you get yeah. at least four wounds back after you take one big hit once, and then you like I yeah. it off. And most models aren't hitting you for more than four wounds right. anyway. And moving on to the anointed, this is one of my favorite operatives. Oh, um, he's I love this guy. Yeah, but what would you use this operative for when you would take him? I know that you said you don't always take him into higher tech, depending pop, prop, pop, uh, probably on the map. Yeah. Um, but like, uh, what do you, what do you usually use? Is is he like the distraction Carnifex? Like, what is he? What 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 do you use this so, tech for? I've actually never found myself actually dropping him. Just considered it. I don't think I'd ever consider dropping him again after certain games. But I use him. I pair him typically with my leader, who's oh, well, was mostly a champion for the extra APL. So it kind of makes up for the fact that the anointed can't do mission actions. And he is being an aggressive model, most, mostly attacking my opponent's home objective and being a very big nuisance. Because even though he can't do mission actions, he doesn't necessarily have to be doing them. He's just trying to deny my opponent from doing them. And you typically give this guy Nurgle to make it so that he is yep. like extremely, extremely tanky. Yeah, um, so his abilities are his shooting is a regular bolt pistol with range 8. And then for his melee, he's 5 on 3, it's 4 5 rending. And then once per battle, when you declare his activation, you can unleash the demon. And what that does is in melee, it gives him lethal 5, rending, and ceaseless. He can't do pickup or mission actions. But also, any damage of four or higher is reduced by one innately in shooting and melee. So, and what does Nurgle do again? Four. Nurgle does something. Nurgle is on a five up, reduce one from three or yeah, more in normal. Damage. So, like, you could regularly just get normal and crit damage down yeah. to the You could be damage. struck for four damage with the anointed and bring it down to two, potentially. And against guardsman las guns he takes one damage no it's you have to, it has to be a damage of four more right so these both proc okay. at the same time which makes it come down to two thank goodness wow i wouldn't I it didn't, can't I go lower than two it's take. basically minimum two that's still wild that's still yeah. wild yeah it's yeah. it's really dumb so he is insanely tanky with nurgle with no piercing and he is one of the most unkillable models in the game in melee so Good luck. That's exciting. Yeah. All right. All right. And then we have the Balefire Acolyte. How would you use this model? I know that you talked about him, like you you guys would trade and stuff, but it's hard, it's hard to say, like, I do damage here, I do this. Like, could you walk it through for layman's terms um, that might be a little bit more easily to understand about how you kind of right. use this model and then also heal with him and it makes him, like, reliably insane? Yeah, so this model has a bolt pistol, which is regular bolt pistol, and he has fell dagger, which is five on three, it's three four rending life siphon. And he has two second spells, which are shootings, which is one a fire blast, four on three is three four, blast two, one inch devastating one and severe. Is that severe? Saturate, not severe. So a good tool against hordes, and then he has life siphon, which is the main thing you're using him for. It's five on threes, three three saturate and siphon life the siphon life ability which is also on the melee is for each normal hit you strike with you heal one wound on your selected operative and for each crit it's d3 wounds and you pick an operative within six before the melee and visible so you just heal your demon or heal yourself yeah so what you can do how i typically use this model is you have one or two operatives depending on your home objective and then you have the other ones attacking both the middle and the the home the opponent's home objective uh -huh. and you put him in the middle of all those operatives and he's kind of one of your later activations going and striking at the enemy after they've moved up and healing the models who have already been striking so you can heal he can heal himself in melee too so after in a turn in which like after you activate heal two operatives let's say your opponent charges them he picks to heal himself and because of that is essentially like four five or five six because he's doing damage while the opponent's damage is reduced due to his healing. So he's like striking and healing himself as his opponent. He's basically an indestructible wall. That's pretty gross. Yeah. Like, even if his siphon life only worked on himself, he'd still be incredible. Yeah. 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 
So yeah, he's a he's a big support asset. I typically position him between the other models, sort of in the middle, and he's activating later to shoot an operative to heal me, someone else, or to charge and fight an operative to heal someone else, or both. And it's just a, a way to increase the durability of the team. That's fair. I mean, the team is already so durable; they just need more, right? Just, just of course not. <laughs> so the butcher. Did you ever find yourself taking the butcher? Uh, I took it a couple times. I took the butcher into Void Dancers because you can make it corn and strike him for one crit and kill them. Also, his new abilities are enemy operatives cannot get combat support against him. Um, what's the new wording for that? Assist. Cannot assist. No assisting, which is yeah, pretty good. I, I saw, I'm pretty sure I saw this operative taken pretty much every time in the Legionary Mirror mm -hmm. match. Uh, yeah. not, maybe huh. not yours. I didn't look at yours a lot. We did not take it. I think I saw James take this model all the time. All the time. All the time. One hit kills almost. Like, yeah. Or two hits and, still. Like... Yeah. And I, I don't remember Janice taking it, but I do remember um, James taking it pretty much every single game. Yeah. Because his 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 legionary his butcher is a world bearer, so it was white. So it was like the only white model on the board. And he was just like you would just be like super far forward, just murdering everything. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. recognizable. The butcher <laughs> oh. is a very good model, and I didn't take him very often, but he's a very good tool to have because his other ability is at the end of each of your enemy operatives' activations, you can select an enemy operative within two inches and do a two inch charge into them, and you can flip from conceal to engage to do it. So it's a change from last edition where he had a two-inch engagement range. It's I'd say it's actually kind of better now because even though your opponent can walk up and shoot him, you just immediately hide in melee afterward with your Nurgle defense. Yeah, because uh, you could you could like have this model charge and fight somebody and let's say kill them or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, if somebody's too close on one of. Uh, the next out and you know thing not a counteract he just like charges and then on a counteract he could kill that model yep. and then charge another model within two inches yeah yeah he basically kept that. the perpetual aggression he has perpetual aggression. Amazing. i like it i like it the only yeah. saving grace is that he hits on a four at least yeah, yeah. but the equipment kind of helps with that too when we can yeah, get down to the letter but um <laughs> yeah the other disgusting thing is you can run in his corn and make him six eight so I'm assuming that's why James Robinson took him into Janice because he can charge in and be like, you're a legionary with Nurgle. I don't care. And you're dead. Hit. Yeah. 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 That's six, eight. Like it's crazy that this team, like they saw it with angels of death. They were like the captain can't get six, eight or he can't go. Like, his power fist can't become six, eight, you know, with shock and awe. You're not allowed to, uh, you can go six, seven, but not six, eight. And uh, this guy's like, nah, dude, I'm. I I six eight this all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's so it's so gross. So gunner options. I know that you said you would never take the flamer. Uh, yeah. Did you find yourself taking the melted gun pretty much almost every game? Um, no, actually, there were a few games where I didn't take any gunner because okay. you don't necessarily need the, the like the long range output. But if I'm taking a gunner, it was for the most part a melta especially into a matchup against Legionary, um, Angels of Death, or Nemesis Claw, because since those teams don't have a way to negate piercing, it can still just one-tap them. So uh, other than the Nurgle, they can go make the piercing go down to one, right? Other than Nurgle, one. there's only one team that can make piercing go down to one, and that's uh, Warp Coven. And I still took the Melta and Warp Coven. Are disgusting. Well, yeah, we yeah. have the option for potentially devastating four. Like, of course you're going to take it. Absolutely. Yeah. That was the other team that I actually found some tough toughness with in practice games because they have so much access to mortal wounds and um, can, like, the teams that have mortal wounds and ways to guarantee crits are the ones that Legionary can struggle with. And Jason is also a, a, a very good player. player. Yes, he yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, now I did see you take the, uh, the heavy bolter many times, um, yeah. specifically into other elite matchups as well. Yeah. You want to explain, uh, what, what you would take and why you would take it when you were taking legendary heavy gunners. Yeah. So in this edition, I would never take the Reaper chain cannon ever again, 
he was so good last edition and they they got terrified pissed their pants and then threw him in the trash because <laughs> now he's the same amount of attacks as a heavy bolter and he's less damage even though he has punishing and, rel- and uh potentially relentless if you pay for fickle fates which is uh-huh. the zinch boy it's not enough damage to be worth it he has a torn two profile but the blast on the crack on the missile launcher is just better so you're pretty much always taking if you're taking a heavy gunner the missile launcher or the heavy bolter i like the missile launcher against horde teams or teams that have like around 10 wounds with no negation for piercing because the five seven is just you need four hits and you auto kill them so and then for horde teams the blast is obviously very good and then I took the Heavy Bolter a lot into Elite specifically because the piercing and the ways to guarantee hits with um, the equipment and with the punishing makes it reliably bringing them very low or killing them. Does a uh, Heavy Bolter count as a bolt weapon? So you can shoot it twice? No. But on Into the Dark, what you can do is you can shoot and then go on guard. So it's effectively double shooting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, or did... you can shoot with it and then shoot with his bolt pistol because this operative does have a bolt pistol. Yeah, I saw Janice take the missile launcher quite a lot, especially into other elites. You run into the same thing where if you just hit, get two crits and they can't, they don't save. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you do just one tap something, uh, yeah. possibly. Um, I think that you know, heavy bolter missile launcher is probably definitely the way to go. Um, yeah. So, and then we have the icon bear, uh, oh. star of the team here. This guy. <laughs> oh yeah, this is the reason the team works so good. If they remove the fact that the Icon Bear gets you next to CP, that in itself nerfs the team quite a bit. Because even they are very versatile, but they are very versatile because they have the access to the CP that they need. So what this operative does is it's an Icon Bear, so he counts as one extra APL objectives. And then he has Favor of the Dark Gods, which is in each turning point in which he's alive, he gets you an extra CP, which accounts for turning point one. So you're starting the game on 4 CP, and then you're not spending anything turning 1-1, one, one, unless you mess up and you need to reroll for defense, or need to spend for a or like that. And then turn 2, you're going into it with either 6 or 7 CP, and if you don't need to spend your ploys turn 2, you might go into turning point 3 with 8 to 9 CP. <laughs> or 10. Or 10. Or 10. Yeah, that's a lot. I've never That's... been in a situation where I've been to 8, 9, or 10 because I do use the CP a lot, even turn 2. But it's possible. And it, what makes it possible is so dumb. Yeah. Like... Now, what's interesting about uh, this model as well is um, if you give, if you make him a Zinch operative, uh, you know, he can have five, a uh, possibility of having essentially five APL on a singular point uh, because it's a, uh, so changes because changes are cumulative with it. So yeah. did you did you find yourself giving this model Zinch, or did you also um, give this model Nurgle? I've considered taking the model Zinch, but not for the mutability and change play, just because you can double shoot with rending, punishing, and severe with mm-hmm. a bolt gun. Because what you're how you play with this model is you guard the back objective, stay as safe as possible, and I almost never even actually use him as a shooting operative. I just use him as an option if I need it. Because you need him alive. He is like, him and the Balefire are your two most important assets to the team. I'd say your Icon Bearer is more important. Um, Because I've lost the Balefire in early games and been fine. But if you lose the Icon Bearer in early game, it's really punishing. So what if they just remove the Icon Bearer from the team itself? And that's how they nerf the team. Does that take them out of S tier? I don't know if it takes them out of S tier, but it definitely makes a lot of teams have game into them now. In fact, it, you, it would make them not have so much access to rerolls because that's one of the things. They have the ploys, which they spend typically like two, maybe three CP on. Then they have four to five CP left over sometimes for rerolls, which gives them essentially like relentless in defense and like balanced or ceaseless in melee mm. in multiple situations where they need it which most teams don't have the option for. So I think they'd still be asked here. It just wouldn't give them rerolls. Because uh, yeah. they could still use it for the ploys, but they, they just don't have the rerolls. I got it. Make this guy, he can only take undivided. He's still insanely good. You just can't benefit from anything else. Huh. 
possible. I mean, who knows what they're going to do. I don't know if that does I, enough because you just literally keep them alive anyway. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't you matter. You're doing the same thing anyways, but it's just yeah. one yeah. of the things. Like, I've always think of a million different fixes for this team, and it's just hard to like. Make this yeah. guy zinch, make him zinch, and make him shoot <laughs> and do crazy that. stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm down with. Uh -huh. You'd be like, I'm going to charge onto this objective. You have two models here, and I'm just going yeah. to steal it. That or what they do is they just make it an action. An action is far more balanced. Yeah. Yeah. Like, or have him stand the objective, want something. Yeah. Or turn in which he does like a mission action, you gain a CP. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. They just need to make it, they just need to make it not make free. you less action efficient. Yeah. That's fair. Not free. like he also, has to sit there, he has to sit there and power up like Goku in order to give yeah. you the CP, you know? <laughs> yeah. Also, if we want to read the mutability and change play real quick, I'm not sure if it lasts until after the model's activated. I think it goes away when they're done. So I don't know if adding 5 EP on the objective works. Uh, use this firefight point until the end of the operative's activation. Mm. So, but you could run up and like yeah. So you could make yourself a loot ATL, action, move or... and take it from like two vet, like two death core models that you wouldn't control it afterwards, possibly. But you would. But you, you could take it from them, which is which is definitely useful. You just can't stand on there with five APL. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So we have the Shrive Talons and the Warriors left here. Uh, now. Okay. What about the Shrive Talon would you use him for? I know that you sacrificed him in your last game, which was a very interesting strategy. Or not your last game. one of My your second games. to last game. Yeah. Um, and that was like your entire intent was to just sacrifice him and trade him for a more valuable model. Um, yeah. What was your your thought process on that? And what was yeah. the model that you valued over the Shrive Talon in order to do a one-for-one -one trade? So essentially, the Shrive Talon has a Bolt Pistol and Flensing Blades, which is 4 on 3, 3 5, Lethal 5, which is okay. It's not very good into Elites, though. Their abilities are whenever fighting or targeting after combat, you can pick an operative within 3 inches if you incapacitate an enemy operative and stun them, which we went over that pretty good. Their other ability is like um, Vicious Reflexes, which is you are, if you are the defender, you are treated as the attacker, so you pretty much always fight first which is really good. And uh, their last thing, which is what I mostly take him for, is the Grizzly token, which uh, is 2 APL, but when you put it down on an objective, your opponent counts as one less total APL on that objective, and it costs them one extra APL to do mission actions on that objective. So basically, how I would run him is I would pre-game dash him with the scouting phase into a place where he's safe, and then move him and use his two APL on the middle objective or on a home objective to put the Grizzly token down. And in that sense, I'm okay with losing him, even if I'm not necessarily trading him. I would like to trade him, so I'm not losing, pulling behind on models. But his whole point is basically just guarantee me to be ahead on the crit op. Because I push for the crit op of Legionary primarily. They are very good at it. And because sometimes there are situations the attack op can be difficult, and I never like relying on the kill op. It's your opponent can deny it. It's dicey, and uh, I'd rather go for what I know I can control. Mm -hmm. um, so he's very good at securing you two of the three objectives, and I was okay. It was against Janice. We played a mirror match, and I put my strive talent up onto an objective, kind of behind a wall, but she was able to move dash the melta up and break the cover line and shoot it, mm -hmm. and I was okay with that because I valued the melta over the strive talent because the melta can pretty reliably do 12 wounds to a legionary model which is not killing it but that breakpoint is pretty good so i was okay with the fact that she traded her tribe talent for her melta or my tribe talent for her melta because i i like the i like having the melta over the tribe talent even so that's why my thought process behind that they're pretty much i put the grizzly token down then i don't care what happens they're doing whatever else they can like trading for a more important model, but yeah, they're pretty much just like my they're my most throwaway throwawayable model. That's fair. After the grizzly mark, of course. After the grizzly token, I don't want them to die before they put it down. Right. The funny thing is, though, I actually <laughs> forgot to account for the grizzly token in our game, so it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, so the last operative of legionary is the legionary warrior, um, yeah. which we went over a little bit earlier, and that's yeah. uh. This operative, uh, when it's activated, you can change its mark of chaos keyword, which is ah, yes. objectively uh, objectively good. You know, I mean, it makes the, yeah. the, the model good. Would you take these uh, every game as well, or were you sticking mostly to the uh, the normal operatives? So, 
in theory, the Warrior is really good. I never played an opponent in which I found myself taking it. I think into teams like Inquisition, Pathfinders, Deathcore, like teams like that, the Warrior can be very good. It's just um, in most matchups, the, the specialists are better. But the fact that you can take like a bolt gun with your equipment Malefic Blades, which is 5 on 3, 3, 4 in melee, and increase the damage in that, is really good because you can be a huge threat in long range and in melee and have like Nurgle for defense or Slanesh for defense or Corn for offense. It just makes them so versatile. So into teams like Inquisition or Pathfinders, I might take like one or two warriors. Mm -hmm. But uh, I never played against those, so I didn't find myself taking it at SoCal. That's fair. Yeah, nobody brought Pathfinders, right? No, because they're they're not great. They're not yeah. great. But they're also they're not bad. They're, they're a little bad. Them, someone they're knows how to bad. play them better, right? But even then, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on to the next, we're going to go on to faction equipment, which is the end. And then I'm going to talk to you about uh, st st uh, strategies on Volcus, strategies on Into the Dark. And um, I don't know if you've thought about Octarius, but Octarius could be at Worlds. Uh, we'd have to, hmm. have to see. Um which I think all of us have played on Octarius enough to, you know, figure it out. Yeah. Uh, warded armor, we talked about earlier. Uh, it is disgusting. How about you give us the rundown yeah. once again? So what warded armor is, is in the gambit phase, the strategic gambit phase, you select one friendly legionary operative, and for the rest of the turn, they have a two-up save. Which is really good. It is so good. Especially if you give it to, like, the anointed, it make it's so dumb if you give it to the anointed. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I like it. I like, like it a lot. I'm sitting here with minus one damage with a two up save and no piercing on your home point. Get me off. Yeah, and then can't you give like portable barricade to somebody else so there's like two people? Yeah, you can have two two up saves on the scene. Yeah, it's in yeah, it's it's good. You know, it's totally well universal equipment is totally well thought out and totally totally legit. totally totally legit. You know, I definitely totally. think that uh they knew exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They definitely they, were not uh, high and drunk. Yes, nope, no problems nope. at all. I'm pretty I'm Zero. pretty sure I'm pretty sure that uh, you know I think that's actually the majority a lot of the problems that come with this edition specifically has to deal with universal equipment. Uh it, it's just not well thought out. Uh, what yeah. about Malefic Blades? And tell us some of the combinations, because you said you were going to tell us the combinations yeah. with Malefic Blades. So Malefic Blades is essentially all of your operatives on your kill team receive five attacks, hitting on threes, three, four as a melee option. And uh, what you can do is you can run like four operatives that are focused around shooting. Then you can make them also have some of the best melee in the game on top of that. Yep. It is so dumb. <laughs> like, you could take a Melta, a Heavy Gunner, and two Bolt Gun Warriors, or one Bolt Gun Warrior and one Bolt Gun Icon Bearer, and they all have 5 on 3s, 3 5 with Blood for the Blood God, or 4 5 with Blood for the Blood God if they're corn. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to charge, sword. fight, fight, shoot with this dude, because they're, they're Zinch, with like a warrior, makes himself Zinch, with a Blood Blade, charge, fight, fight, shoot. Yep, that's, uh, you know. Well, they could like, yeah. That's it's it's blades on shooting operatives is really good. They made the blades too good. Yeah, it should be like four on threes, three five. Yeah, which is what they did last edition. I think they nerfed it last edition, and they undid it. Yeah, I think they I think they they nerfed a lot of the three five damage weapons except for like uh heart the the jaegers the jaegers still have a yeah. three five plasma knives yeah. which uh, i am very envious yeah. of i don't know why they get it and yeah they brought don't. this one down from three five to three four but you can make it three five again so who cares yeah who right cares? yeah so tainted rounds uh tainted rounds is is really good it gives yeah, you yeah so rending. what tainted rounds is is that you have once per turning point you select a friendly operative when they are performing action with they shoot with a bull gun or bull pistol or any bolt weapon that's not a heavy bolter, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you just give it for that action, rending. The downside is you have to declare it before you shoot, so you could declare it and then not roll rending, which sucks sometimes, but it is a very good tool to have, especially on Zinch. But I think that's also something very important for everyone who doesn't play Legionary. Uh, people have to declare it. 
you know yeah like, you like, have they, to declare they, tainted they, rounds they can't just be shoot. like oh we're I'm, i have tainted rounds like it's good you know yeah no yeah and it is it's not like you give the model rending for its activation it's only for the one shoot action you can't use it twice per activation yeah and it's only once per turning point oh and that's yeah yeah which you just literally once just per said. turning point once per action yeah so moving on to um there is still the chaos talisman yeah what does this do so the this... chaos talisman is as a gambit you select one of your marks of chaos to gain the chaos talisman and how it works is in combat or shooting for that for that mark of chaos you can discard two of your success or two of your misses in melee or shooting and retain one as a normal hit to take d3 mortal wounds the thing that makes it so good is that it has no limit to the amount of times you can use it. So, like, I never find myself using it for melee because taking wounds when you're about to fight someone can be pretty painful sometimes. I do not want to bring myself down to a 12 wound model against power weapons. That's yeah. not very smart. Um, but in shooting, when you're having a heavy gunner or a gunner just sitting in the back shooting the whole time, they don't quite care so much when they take a couple wounds, like one to three wounds. So you can just proc some extra hits with your piercing weapons and kill models a lot easier. I actually didn't find myself using it very much, but it's a very nice tool to have. Just in case. See, Just this, in yeah. case. this is what Chaos needs more of. They need more, I have great power, but I kill myself using it. Like the, um, there was an old rule back in, I forget what edition of 40K, where one of the demon weapons did damage to you if you didn't roll hot. Right? Yes, but it, it gave you like crazy. I think it was seventh. I think it was seventh. It, it might seventh, have also right? been eighth. It might have also been eighth. And I think it was also in sixth. Yeah, I think that's like, the. There was the introduction of a brand new uh, lord with the demon weapon. Like, and I think I think Abaddon had it forever. I think it was Abaddon, right? With the Drakniak. How do you say it? Yeah, um, that'd be cool for like the demon blade, right? Like obviously because it's so good. Like okay, it has to have some drawback or else this is just yeah. Like it has you... the hot ability. Hey. Maybe, yeah, pretty much. Dude, if you maybe, roll no crits, maybe. you do lose wins instead of healing wounds. Oh, yo, what would that be sick? Something like that, right? Yeah. Like, like if you I, don't I, resolve I like any crits in the combat, you actually lose like D three plus. I don't think I think D three plus three is way too much, but like maybe D three wounds if you don't yeah, strike with any crits. Wounds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you might strike twice and then you get double whiffs and you're just like, I did damage, but I ate myself at the cost, you know? Yeah. So, on Volcus. Uh, or I should ask you, what equipment did you find taking you yourself taking pretty much every single game? And did it vary on Into the Dark compared to Open? So I will say beforehand, the equipment doesn't really vary depending on the the board layout versus like Gallo Dark or Volcus. Um, I pretty much always took the same thing. I never dropped Warded Armor or Tainted Rounds. I almost never dropped the Chaos Talisman. In fact, I might never have dropped the Chaos Talisman. Those are three that I like always take. Auto takes. Uh -huh. okay. And then whenever I'm going for a shooting based loadout, I take the Bosom Blades. But if I only have like two shooting operatives, I won't take it. I'll do like, um, you know, you can either take smoke grenades or an indirect, you can take light barricades, or you just have the versatility to do other things on the boards based off what you need. But uh, I pretty much always take like three of the faction equipments. Okay. Yeah. Now, um... And then maybe four. Yeah. What what did you find yourself? What was like your stereotypical uh, plan? I know that you said you were kind of really cautious turning point one. You didn't do a yeah. lot. You kind of position yourself to be aggressive or be defensive. Yeah. Um, can you dive more in depth on like your positioning other than like uh, you you said that you would you would control one back with your with your um icon bear and then the rest would kind of go forward towards the middle and towards your yeah. opponent's uh, uh back objective yeah so what i typically find myself doing is i will have the icon bearer like i mentioned i will not so one thing is turn one i will not put anyone on the objectives i will like i don't put myself in a situation where i'm on them because on most boards the objectives are either in the middle or in the um stronghold terrain features which you can be behind light cover safe inside them, but it is easy for someone to walk through a door and get you. What I'm pretty much always looking to position my icon bearer behind the wall, wherever the home objective is, and he's sitting there. And then what I do with the other five operatives is I typically have my um, my leader and my anointed both looking to stage themselves as close as they can to my opponent's home objective while being safe. So my anointed will typically be in a, in a place such as the corner of 
a stronghold feature mm -hmm. so that he can either route himself to the middle of the board or to the the stronghold feature so he's in a place where he's flexible not in threat of multiple options of being shot i don't care if you charge me because i'm probably going demon will turn one and good luck with that but he'll be typically like the corner of a stronghold feature pointed at both the middle and the opponent's home objective i'll typically have my leader right behind my opponent's stronghold door for his home objective because typically the home objective is behind a stronghold door i think there's only one map where it's not but uh so he's typically pointing there then my balefire acolyte will be really close to those two operatives he'll be pushed up kind of towards the middle and home objective for my opponent's side of the board kind of in a place where he can route anywhere kind of like the anointed to heal anyone he needs to and then my gunner operatives or any other operatives taking like the strive talent or butcher they're staging towards the middle they're not going on the middle objective like i mentioned before they're finding heavy cover nearby it where they can stay safe and staging to attack or counter counter attack against my opponent and then heavy gunners typically almost always staying back and shooting from i don't actually find myself putting on advantages very often if i can comfortably like where there's advantages in the deployment zone then i will but he's typically just like standing behind a wall visible like he can see everything so that he's able to shoot and then hide i don't want to give my opponents a shot back afterward and then next turn he can pop out and shoot so that's typically kind of how i go about staging my models that's fair and i think there's a couple i i definitely saw a couple people um you get vantage trapped i would say they would uh stick their models up on one of the ruins and then the person with the heavy cover would then shoot them from their location and um like let's say the third vantage to get through some of the stuff so yeah um yeah i think i think there's definitely some some traps about vantage vantages are also mm, they can be a lot worse um they're, they're they're not guaranteed better you know than they used yeah. to be uh, especially with so much heavy terrain on um, the yeah. the current play styles of maps and stuff. Did you find yourself doing anything different on Into the Dark? Because something that we did was um, we kind of innovated on some of our uh, past asymmetrical maps and kind of yeah. experimented, uh, you know, to start with LVO. And we didn't get a lot of negative feedback on our are um, into the darks. So I think there was only one negative feedback of like, oh, we didn't have a barricade on the middle one and it felt impossible to to get, you know, and that's just kind of mm -hmm. like you have to play it and figure it out, you know, type thing rather than it necessarily being bad. Yeah. Um, so with your into the dark boards, I, I really like them. I like them way better than the ones GW has. Screw GW. Um, they, there was one that was more open than the others, which can't like i don't know if that's necessarily a problem for some teams uh i don't know which one it was but it was one of the long edge deployments and one of the sides they have to defend in a an objective that's one like slightly like just a long corridor with nowhere to stage mm -hmm. i think that might need to be fixed somehow but other than that i like the fact that you're you have more runes and places to stay safe and teams that have to seek light don't just bully on in the dark because yeah, that's just a problem with GW. Like teams like uh, Nemesis Claw, with their move before the turn starts, because doors being shut technically means that you can move closer instead of farther away, because technically they have to move farther away, but it's also technically not farther away because the door's closed. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that, combined with Prey Sight, which turns on Seek Light, makes the GW boards really oppressive, especially if you're playing like Pathfinders or Warp Coven that has Seek Light. So the fact that I, I like your boards because they make that less of a factor. And how I typically played on them was I would go for a similar game plan. I would have my anointed aimed at both a way to move for the middle or the or the opponent's home objective, or just primarily the middle. And then I'd have my leader pointing at their home objective. And if their home objective was like impossible to reach, I would just mainly focus on controlling the middle one along with my own. Mm -hmm. And then Balefires being in the between the mix being able to go wherever he needs to heavy gunners i pretty much always take a heavy gunner on into the dark because you can essentially double shoot with by shooting and going on guard and then icon bears defending my home objective pretty much the same game plan just adapting to what you need to look for where you want to stage with each model that's pretty much all you need to do it's pretty much the same order with each model it's just a matter of where you're going to be doing that 
that's fair. Um, another question for you. Uh, mostly mm-hmm. this one's more about SoCal. Yeah. Um, was there what? Who was your hardest opponent? You can only pick one. You can't choose like all five people. You know, seven yeah. people. Uh, your hardest opponent, and then your your best sportsmanship. So my hardest opponent was Austin, fellow teammate. He got second. It was our final match, and I only managed to win by one point. It was a very close game. He was playing Nemesis Claw. He played very well, and uh, it came down to the last activation where I was able to score champion and deny him taking my crit off. I only won because I had one extra crit off. And it was a very close game, played very well. And uh, yeah, it was it was a very close game, very tough. I think that was probably my hardest opponent. Mm-hmm. And sportsmanship-wise... I'd probably have to give it to uh, Charlotte. She was my round one day day two. Mm-hmm. Uh, very fun game, uh, good experience. Yeah, like that one a lot. She was playing Void Dancers. Yeah, Charlotte's awesome. It was her first time uh, getting top eight at, uh, yeah. at one of our events, and it was uh, pretty cool. Yeah, it was very cool. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, G, did you have any kind of uh, insights while watching the stream? You got to. I had to ping pong around and answer a bunch of questions, mostly like, can I shoot from this vantage to this vantage? You know, and a bunch <laughs> of, but how do ladders work? Um, wait, can I, can I hide here? You know, I, it was, it was a crazy, it was a crazy right? time, crazy time. Um, a lot of people learning the rules, right? And I know that we had quite a few people on stream and it was some of their very first games uh, of the edition. So not everyone played the rules 100%, but this is the very first. I, th- I think a lot of people going to events have to realize that we are playing a brand new edition and everyone can't play the rules correctly two weeks into um, the event, uh, like, like the, the edition dropping, especially with so many questions. Like we made a four hour video on the Warhammer community FAQ, not the community, not Warhammer community, but like, the community FAQ where it's just a bunch of questions that we have as a community that we just don't know the actual answers to. Right. Or there, or let's say the, the, the answers are, are clear. They're not clear to everyone. Right. Right. Uh, Cause English can be a, a fickle beast. Um, but Giacomo watching the games, what did you learn outside of legionary are broken? Uh, <laughs> what else did you learn throughout the event um well specifically for since we're talking legionary for a second specifically like there's times where i thought legionary was gonna lose and then they just pull it back like out of nowhere right like the the resource is nuts um but realistically i think we learned a lot about what counts as obscuring what counts for cover when you're shooting at certain things now that obscuring has changed a bit um, and you're no longer necessarily playing so that you can't be shot, but you're just trying to reduce it. So you, you will play a little closer. Like, you know, you can take a little bit more of a risk to get there. And that was one thing that I, that I'd seen more people do, which is cool. Um, the people adapting to the three objective markers instead of having like six before that was another big one. Uh, you sort of see it become, I don't want to say laney laney is not the word, but you'd notice players will pick two objectives and that's it. Like these are the ones I'm going to go for. And I'll throw maybe a guy to the third to, to, to harm and distract, but really I'm getting two. And those are the two that I'm going to win the game with. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd, I'd say that the game is very linear right now. Right. Um, very linear. That's the word I was looking for. It's linear. Mm-hmm. Um, which is not to say it's terrible. Cause if you wanted to break the linearness of it, you just don't play the mission and you go for the kill up. Right. Which and, is a viable tactic as and, well, you and know. No one to my uh, maybe like one, maybe two people that I saw on stream ever chose kill up. Really, it was I, up and yeah. Dark op. Personally, I really dislike going for kill ops from a primary op because I mentioned it is very swingy. It happens. You score six on the kill op, and you're like, cool, yay, extra points. I do not rely on it. I don't want to have to hunt down my opponent to score points. I want to be able to choose my tack off and focus on that or crit off and just stand on the point. I don't want to hunt them down and potentially sacrifice my other points because that's the problem with kill up. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I love kill up, but that's usually because it, it depends on the people I'm playing against and I'll, I'll be ruthless and just hunt them. You know, <laughs> if, if I don't want to think about strategies, like, no, just roll dice and hunt them. 
Like whatever. I'm playing Angels of Death. This is fine. <laughs> Um, but no, you're right. Like a, a, a obviously a golden ticket winner such as yourself. Will know, like well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that risk. I'd rather, for sure, I can do the tack up. I'm gonna get nine points. Yeah. Go up is very like you're gambling. You know, like yeah. right. If you like to gamble, you're gonna like kill up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. And sometimes yeah, it pay off, and you'll win just because. And then other times you'll get crushed into the dirt because you gambled because you gambled that's that's basically what i learned while watching the stream and of course just refining rules and learning more about some teams little intricacies that i wasn't mm -hmm. aware of mm -hmm. yeah that'd be pretty much everything i took away from that yeah i think i think the addition is a lot more wide than people would expect like for instance like we we get on our battle reports you know people comment and saying like oh you got this rule wrong oh you got this rule wrong it's like yeah well we've never played this team before you know we're doing it for entertainment value um but also um there are 33 brand new teams um you know games workshop did an amazing job at taking every team and making them brand new they changed yeah. literally everything. There's other than maybe some of their unit profiles, there is nothing necessarily about the teams that are exactly the same or functioning even the same as they used to. Like look at look how much legionaries changed, right? They got buffed into the stratosphere. Um and yeah. a lot of the things while similar are very different and the wording is different. And it can be difficult in a competitive environment um, or even at your local game store uh, to know the differences uh, right away, right? Like, um, I think that everyone needs to have a little bit of grace going to events um, at least for six months as people are getting new to the edition. What's interesting is that we're all having a brand new player experience, every single one of us. So it's almost like every single one of us has picked up Kill Team for the very first time we go to an event or we go to our local game store and we don't know what the enemy teams do. You know, there are some people out there that know exactly what they can do or they have it pulled up on their computer as they're, as they're watching stuff, um, able to, 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 to look at stuff, you know, um, or it's pr their particular faction, right? Like for me, I know, I know, uh, death core the best and I know angels of death the best, right? Cause those are the teams that I'm, most interested. I also know Blades of Lame pretty well now because I've played them. Right? <laughs> uh, do I know anything about Vespids? I know that they crush Blades of Lame in close combat, which should not happen, but it does. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> do I know anything about Aquilions? Uh, not really. Um, but I mean, those are the things that we have to remember is that like every person is relearning the game. And even though there's only 10 rule, ten pages of rules, there's also like 50 pages of reference. <laughs> yeah. So things can get a little wild uh, pretty quickly uh, while playing this game. So um, when you're going out to events in the near future, um, hopefully, I think by LVO, the, co the competitive community and the kill team community themselves should have a much better grasp on the... On, on everything, right? Um, I'm going to insert something in the in the beginning of this video, but I do want to shout out LVO. We are pretty much 50% sold out of competitive champs already. We have 150 uh, tickets open, or tickets total for this year, so they don't have 100, uh, 200. So if you are looking to go to the uh, competitive... Um, the biggest competitive event in the world. I would suggest you get your tickets sooner than later um, because if uh, if no one buys their tickets early, FLG might just award us less tickets and we, we might not even know, right? Um, but it is our goal as Squad Games to run the largest kill team event in the world. Um, and I think that is very doable, especially three months out, or two and a half months out, uh, we're already 50% sold out and narrative is sold out already. So yeah. um, make sure that you get your tickets because we very well may sell out really soon. Um, you know, once people start getting the, the FOMO, the tickets are going to start selling and uh, we're going to have some amazing uh, merch 
uh, that we're going to be giving out to, to everyone. And we're going to be selling a bunch of uh, limited edition stuff, hats, t-shirts, token trays, um, bags, all sorts of stuff. So if you guys are interested in coming to LVO, hopefully the best event of the year and that you've ever been to, that is our goal to make that happen. Um, and we look forward to seeing everyone going, uh, Jesh, is there anything yeah. that you want to shout out here at the end? Um, we particularly don't really have any socials. Calcium is going to be trying to in, in like increase social media output, but, uh, no, I'll also shout out LVO. I'm definitely going to be attending. You should definitely also show up. It's going to be a great event. You should, uh, you should buy your tickets, Jesh. <laughs> I think we already have them. We already have them. Are you sure? <laughs> I think we do. All right. <laughs> How about you, G? Uh, yeah, of course, you know, you can join the conversation on Discord, our Discord, which is in the show notes or in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. You know, tell us what you think about Legionnaires. Tell us what you think can take them down. Tell us why you think Joshua is not the best player with Legionnaires. Who knows? <laughs> uh, which currently I don't think is true. I think he is probably the best right now. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see next month when Worlds happens. And of course, you know, you can uh, further support us by joining our Patreon. And uh, you can also watch our other YouTube videos, such as the Hobby Highlander, or catch the FAQ four hours, two parts though, so you can watch it in doses. You don't have to do it all at once, which is mm -hmm. awesome. And of course, you can find me on Instagram at wargaming underscore studios. I'm finishing up those Nemesis Claws, and you can also find Squad Games on Instagram at squad underscore games underscore entertainment, where we're keeping you updated on events and other things that are happening in Squad Games. How about you, Dakota? Um. You know, after SoCal Open, we're pretty much just looking at LVO. We do have the West Coast Championships happening on December 14th. It is going to be a great competitive event. Um, it's very, it's the pairings and seeds are going to be very esports style. It's going to be a, a, basically you're going in as a group. Uh, different groups are going in and they're battling in their own groups. And then they all get put into different brackets on day two. Uh, and uh, each bracket is going to get special stuff. Um, and then there'll be four champions of the West Coast Championship. So there'll be a gold, a silver, a bronze, and an S tier. And the cool thing about S tier, even though it is the lowest bracket, they will all get holographic stuff. Um, so that is exciting. That's going to be happening in middle, the middle of California at Mad Alpaca Games. Um, yeah. So that is going to be our next event. Um, and before that, I am going to be looking forward to getting a lot of streamed competitive practice games um for our battle reports uh i'm looking you guys might see a lot of vet guard because i have to practice <laughs> you know like if i don't play vet guard or some other teams i'm i'm, I'm not gonna know I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna lose worse than i already am with veteran guard <laughs> or sorry death core yeah i'm gonna play against uh and, and it, legionnaires and it's gonna it's gonna go great it's gonna go great. I, I already know. I have I have all yeah. my strategies, and that my strategy is to lose in the kill ops and lose the game. Um. <laughs> you gotta you gotta hype me with your uh, angels of death theory. Your yes. six your six uh, assault intercessors. Yeah, we're gonna have to uh, have you come up to the to the the studio here on a Saturday and get a couple games in, yep. and uh, post one uh, on YouTube and then post the rest on Patreon. Um, so that should be a lot of fun. And yeah. uh, my last shout out again is LVO. If you guys are looking to come to one of the best events, um, looking to come and see us, uh, please come out, please support the community and make sure that we have the biggest event ever again. So uh, that'll be me. Cool. I guess we're signing off here, guys. Until next time. Until next time. Cheers. Talks with Bob. Take a shot. <laughs> <laughs>